Hi, Pastor Chris here. Thank you so much for joining us for our Sunday night broadcast of our live service here at Coastal Community Church. We're so glad that you're here. A couple of things I want to share with you. First of all, we would love to get to know you. If you don't mind, take a moment and log in and chat with us. We'll actually have someone here available throughout the service to answer any questions you might have, but also to pray with you if you have any prayer requests you'd like to share. Also, take a moment and fill out our online connect card, just like we do it live on Sunday morning. We'd like to get to know you as well, so take a moment and fill that out. It's located here on our page. Lastly, if you'd like to donate to the ministry here at Coastal Community Church, you can give your tithes and offerings. You can donate toward the online ministry here at Coastal by giving through our website or texting. All that information is found here on our website. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope to see you in person soon. Have a great evening. God bless.
just going to rise. We're going to raise a hallelujah this morning. But it's not going to be just any hallelujah. This is going to be that moment where we say, God, you are in control. Come on, just lift up your hands to me this morning. We're going to declare this in faith this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Good morning. 
can't grow solid because of our current situation. And I believe that this morning is that moment where every wall, every barrier that you had that's separating you from God right now, I'm telling that wall to fall right now, that this praise is gonna to begin to, to shake the rooftop, that our faith is just gonna rise. And we're gonna sing a new song. That those doors you've been praying for open will open in the name of Jesus. That our praise will not be silent. Come on.
Jesus is. That's why Coastal exists, to share and experience the life and the love of Jesus with Charleston and the world. And it just starts right here. And uh, we're just so excited that you're here with us today. Uh, my name is Pastor Chris. Uh, uh, glad that you're here. Uh, if you're watching online, we'd like to welcome, uh, welcome you as well. Uh, on your way in today, you should have gotten one of these. It's our program, our bulletin. If you didn't get one, just raise your hand and somebody from our First Impressions team will bring one to you. There's all kinds of important stuff in here. Uh, your announcement sheet, if you would go ahead and pull this out. Uh, check out all the different things that are happening uh, here in the life of our church. Uh, next uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, August the 17th, uh, we have our next membership class. And if that's the next step uh, for you here at Coastal, maybe you've been coming for a while and you're ready to uh, say, you know what? This church is my church. It's no longer that church or their church. Uh, it's my church family, my church home. And you'd like to formalize your commitment. Uh, our next membership class is this coming Saturday. Uh, you can sign up for that on the back of your Connect card. And I'll draw everybody's attention to that in just a moment. Uh, today, on your way out, I actually want to make sure that you stop off at, the, there's a couple of tables back there in the very back by our kiosk. Uh, and at one of those tables, you'll find uh, are an empty coastal blue bag. It's one of those blue fabric bags. Actually, it's not empty. Inside of it, uh, there is a list of some stuff that we need for our community food bank. We feed a lot of people here at Coastal uh, week in and week out. People are hungry, people are hurting, uh, and need some assistance. And so we've been uh, making an announcement about bringing food. A lot of you have done that. We're so appreciative. But we thought, wow, this would be a, an easy, simple way to encourage people to do that. Just pick up one of these blue bags, uh, take it home, fill it up, and uh, bring it back. And if you keep the bag and you don't fill it up, shame on you, you're going straight up. No, I'm just teasing. Anyway, um, but make sure you uh, bring the bag back full of food. Uh, the other thing that I want you to do when you go back there to the back, notice there's a, a Christmas box there uh, on, on, the, on the floor, a big Christmas box. And that's because we are already uh, collecting things for Operation Christmas Child. 
especially, you ready for this? School supplies, woo! Right, school starts. I know if you're a teacher, you're going back to Charleston County, I think this week. Uh, school starts the following week for students, which means school supplies are on sale. And so it's a great time uh, to get some school supplies for Operation Christmas Child. So if you have any questions about that, see Teresa Spell. She'll probably be hanging out back there by the box if you have any questions about that. The other thing that I want to draw your attention to back there in the back, there's a sign-up uh, table. Uh, it's got a little sign on it that says Daring Faith. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing announcements today is because I'm not preaching today. Galen Moyer, uh, the, the man who leads our prayer and decision area, our prayer team, uh, he's preaching today. I know some of you are thinking, man, Pastor Chris, you haven't preached in forever. You know, what are you, what are you doing with all this free time, you know? Uh, well, one of the things that I've been doing is preparing and planning for the fall and our Daring Faith campaign. And so we are having a series of 13 meetings. In fact, inside your bulletin, there's a little list of all those different meetings. You probably got an email from me this week about it. And uh, so there's 13 different meetings, different days, different times, uh, morning meetings, evening meetings, uh, all throughout the week. You just need to pick one. And so there's three different ways to sign up, but you only have to sign up one time, one way, just like groups. But these are not life groups. Let me be clear on that. This is a meeting where you're going to learn all about our Daring Faith campaign. You're going to receive our Daring Faith campaign packet. Uh, you're going to get an offering bank, a, our, our coloring book that we've been working on, uh, the devotional guide, everything that goes along with our Daring Faith campaign. You're going to see pictures of phase two, what we're going to build. Uh, we're going to attempt something so big and so great that without God, we're going to fail. And uh, it's going to be awesome. And so we're going to explain all of that at these meetings. Um, and so you can sign up. There, the sign-up list are back there on the back table. You can sign up on your Connect card, and you can go to our website and sign up there. Um, but I pray, uh, last week we already had like 50 families already sign up. And they just signed up from their Connect card. And evidently, everybody loves pancakes because a lot of you signed up for the pancake breakfast on Saturday, September the 14th. But there's going to be good food at all of them, I promise you. So uh, the other thing that I want to draw to your attention to in your, in your bulletin is your Connect card. Everybody go ahead and take that out. And if you don't mind, go ahead and begin filling it out. If you are a guest with us today, don't be afraid of filling this out. I am not going to show up at your house this week. We're not going to stalk you or harass you. Uh, we simply want to send you a little note of thanks for being here today. And uh, after the service, if you are a guest, if you'll make sure you'll stop by uh, the blue welcome and guest tent that's in between these two buildings. And at that little tent, uh, we have some volunteers there, but we also have a gift for you. And uh, we'd like to give you a little uh, gift of thanks for being here today. Uh, but also, uh, on the front of your Connect cards, all your contact info, how you heard about Coastal, whether you're a first, second time, regular attender, or member. And then on the back, let us know about any decisions that you might make today, uh, any next steps. Uh, again, there's that sign up for the Daring Faith meeting, the membership class. Uh, if you're leading a life group uh, this fall, we got a ton of life groups. I'm so excited about groups this semester. Uh, you need to let us know which training you're coming to, and if you're interested and learning more about providing child care at some of all of these events that we're having, let us know about that as well. Uh, any prayer requests, uh, we'd love for you to share those on your Connect card. And at the very end of our service, we're all going to turn these uh, Connect cards in blue offering buckets. Uh, after church, uh, again, drop by the back, check, pick, out, pick up a blue bag, uh, sign up for one of the Daring Faith campaign meetings, uh, free Panera bread, uh, make your way into the Welcome Center. Uh, restrooms are to the left and again today back from popular demand evidently you guys love some caffeine uh, we have cold brew today uh, we went through a lot of cold brew last week so it's also out there at the cafe everything is free as usual Whew, I think that's all I got for you today everybody doing good you happy doing well full of joy and excitement I've heard Galen's message it's great uh, you're going to be blessed today. Do me a favor. Everybody smile, stand up, find somebody you hadn't met yet today, introduce yourself, and welcome them to Coastal.
All right, well, good morning, Coastal. Uh, as Pastor Chris already said, I'm Galen Moyer. Um, my wife and I, Perry, lead the prayer and response team here, and uh, I'm a hospice chaplain here in the area. Been a part of Coastal for about five years, and uh, Pastor Chris has given me the opportunity to speak here once or twice a year over the last few years, and so I've welcomed these opportunities, and so I'm uh, looking forward to share with you this morning. We are going to continue in our summer reading series, and our book today is The Daniel Dilemma. Uh, it is written by Pastor Chris, uh, actually not our Pastor Chris, uh, Pastor Chris Hodges of Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, so as we begin this morning, uh, let's pray together. God, I just pray that you give us ears to hear your word. Give us faith to believe that you'll meet us here and that you're going to speak to us today. Amen. So what is the Daniel Dilemma? Well, in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, there were a group of young men particularly and others who were carried off into captivity. There were four in particular that our story follows. Uh, we're familiar with these four. They were captured out of their Hebrew Jewish culture and taken into a culture that was in complete opposition to their faith. So the dilemma came when they were commanded to bow to an idol or in Daniel's case, to pray to a king. But their faith commanded them to only bow to one God. So consequently, uh, there's a dilemma. Would they bow or will they stand? Now, there's two primary stories we're going to follow uh, today that are in this book. Uh, the first one uh, is a story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these guys had been brought there when they were young. They had been there for a number of years by this time. They had proven themselves worthy and they had been raised into a position of leadership in the country. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a situation where the king says that everybody must bow to a giant golden idol that he had made of himself. And their response is this, we will not bow. Our God will protect us. But even if he does not, we will never serve or worship your gold statue. Now, as we know, these three men, they're thrown into a super hot furnace, or we often hear the fiery furnace, uh, but it was so hot that the guards couldn't even survive the heat to get them in the fire. And after they're in the fire, the king looks, and he sees they're not burning up. They're actually walking around in the fire. Their ropes have been burned off, and he sees there not only three men like he had thrown in. He says, didn't we throw three men in? I see four men in the fire, but the fourth one looks like a god. There's another in the fire with them. Daniel then, in his situation, he'd been raised up to a position of overseer over governors of the land. And a group of his fellow, fellow governors, they were jealous of his position, but because of his integrity, there was nothing that they could find against him. And so the only thing they could use against him was his religion. And so they went to the king, and the king didn't quite know what they were getting at, but they had him put in place a law that said you can only pray to the king. But here's Daniel's response. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. With his windows open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. So we know the story after this, he's thrown into the lion's den. The king actually didn't want to do that because the king liked him, but he had kind of been tricked into this situation. And so they throw him into the lion's den. And the next morning, the king rushes down there at dawn and he goes down and he says, Daniel, is the God that you serve, was he able to protect you from the mouth of the lions? And we know the answer was yes. So the subtitle of the book today is How to Stand Firm and Love Well in a culture of compromise. Now, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had to learn to live in a culture of compromise. And I think we also have to figure out how to do that in our world today. Now, I am, as I said, a hospice chaplain, and I am constantly invited into people's homes of every race, every religion, every persuasion and belief that you can imagine. In each of these relationships, I'm continually discerning how to walk out this tension between standing firm and loving well. Now, my personality by nature is that I want to please people. And as a result, there are times that I lean more toward acceptance and more toward loving well than standing firm. I want to give grace and not necessarily speak truth. At times, I notice that people are desperate for the truth. And in general, I think they are. But sometimes it's more obvious and I'll speak that truth more freely than others. There are some times when I go away realizing that I didn't speak truth when I should have. 
You see, we have a world that is desperately in need of truth. And because of that, we need to resolve the question, what is truth? Where does truth come from? And what do I believe? So let's start by looking at the truth about God or the truth without God. Is there truth without God? You see, what you believe about God and what you believe about yourself is going to determine whether you're willing to stand or whether you're prepared to stand out from the crowd to to stand firm when challenge and opposition comes. We've got to determine ahead of time what our response is going to be. We can't wait until that opposition comes. We've got to determine whether God is worth taking a risk for and whether it's worth risking our comfort and our security. What's going to rule our lives? Is it going to be the God of the Bible or the gods of peace and safety and security? And I will tell you honestly, there have been many times in my life when I bow to the gods of peace and safety and security. My natural response is I want to get along and not make waves. But somehow, Daniel and his friends, they were, even though they were probably in their teens where they were carried away into captivity, they were taken into this land of compromise and they lived not only through their teens, the 20s, 30s, 40s, on throughout from generation, you know, for several generations, where they continued to stand firm in the face of opposition. And when that opposition came, they did stand firm. So how were they able to be so firmly established in this faith system that they had even before the testing came? Well, you know, the Christian faith in America today, I think, is in a bit of a crisis. Uh, We've had a faith system in place for quite a long time, for generations. It worked well, where the family was the primary source of truth. The church supported that. And to be honest, for many generations, the culture supported that as well. But at some point, the role seemed to get reversed to where the church became the primary source of truth. The family kind of supported it, and the culture became rather wishy-washy. We didn't quite know where it was going to go in that regard. But not so much today. I don't know exactly how or when it happened, but sometime around the 1960s, cultural revolution, prayer was removed from schools. There, There was a focus on the separation of church and state. But since then, we've had several generations where many of you have grown up not going to church, not reading the Bible, not learning about God. You've been taught your value system and worldview from an education system that intentionally excluded God. And your views have been shaped by media, news, entertainment, now social media, that despises faith. You got your worldview from them because that's all that you knew. That's all you had. Your parents were told they shouldn't shove religion down your throat, and many of them did not. Now, for others of you, you have lived in a divided world. You've been taught by your parents and your church that God should be the foundation for your life. But at school and from friends and culture and media, you're taught that God didn't exist and that it's foolish to believe in him. As a result, you're not really sure who to believe about faith, not sure if God and the church can be trusted. In that confusion, there's an open door then that comes and we turn toward a spirituality and a faith of our own design rather than toward the one of the God of the Bible. We pick and choose our beliefs based on our own understanding instead of based on a foundation of enduring truth. And this new spirituality, it it says if it feels right to you, then it is right for you. Now, there's, there's no community of faith in this new spirituality, no discernment based on the body of believers. There's no foundation of faith that's built on scriptures that have stood the test of time, but it's all about the individual And what the individual determines is right. You know, the Bible predicts that this time would come. A time will come when people will not listen to accurate teachings. Instead, they will follow their own desires and surround themselves with teachers who tell them what they want to hear. People will refuse to listen to the truth and turn to myths. So if that's the world we live in, what do we do? Where does this leave us? Christianity is often confused about what's the right way to engage, what's the right way to interact with this world. Do we boldly take a stand and proclaim our faith or do we stand for truth or do we bow and remain silent? Now, we all know the stories of Christians throughout time who have been rude and overbearing and mean and they've turned us off against faith and turned others off against faith and none of us wants to be that person. But truth must be communicated and it must be communicated with grace. Chris Hodges says it this way in the book. He says, truth without grace is mean But grace without truth is meaningless. 
You see, grace without truth is a life with no rules or no values and no parameters, no guardrails. And, and what it does, it leaves, if we leave truth totally behind with a focus on grace, the world doesn't find the boundaries that it needs. They're searching for boundaries and they don't know where to turn to find them. They'll just feel accepted by us as believers, but they'll bl march blindly into oblivion over the ledge into disaster. You see, we live in a world that has taught us that there is um, no absolute truth. I've heard some of you say that before coming to Coastal or before coming part of a, a faith community, you honestly didn't know the truth. You didn't know that it was better to be generous and to look out for others, better than just watching out for yourself. Or you didn't know that God had designed us for marriage, relationships with one man and one woman for life. You didn't know that same-sex relationships were not part of God's best design or that it was not okay to sleep with your girlfriend or your boyfriend or that it's not okay to get drunk, to use foul or crude language, to hate others, hold grudges, or that life could be lived free of fear and could be free of peace and have peace instead of anxiety. But how could you know it was wrong if nobody told you? No one in our culture teaches us those things. Nobody tells us what the guardrails are that would protect us. So you can know what would protect you from going off that edge into broken relationships and pain and addiction. Now, if, if you're a Christian or a Christ follower, I expect you to have a Christian worldview. But for those who are not Christ followers, if, if they don't see a biblical worldview lived out by us, it confuses them and they don't quite know what to do with that. The non-Christian believes that the world revolves around them. Sadly, I think many times as Christians, we believe that as well. At least we live that way. Luke 9, verse 23, in contrast, says, If anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Now, I'm not sure, even though I've been a part of church all of my life, I'm not sure that I know or any of us really know what does it mean to take up our cross daily? What does that look like? But you have to admit that's different than what our world tells us. It stands out. To give up our own way, to deny ourselves. why would we do that? And I think Christians are confused about this. A recent poll points this out. It was a poll of Christians and it showed that when it came to making their moral choices, 31% said, I make my moral choices based on what feels right and comfortable. 18% said, I make moral choices based on whatever is best for me. 14% said, I make moral choices based on whatever causes the least conflict with others. Only 16% reported that I make my moral choices based on what the Bible says. See, what this means is that as Christians, we have a non-Christian worldview. Now, if you ask the same question of the general public and not just believers or followers of Christ, you're going to find that with each succeeding generation, they're less likely to believe in any kind of enduring and unchanging truth. Now, if you were in your teens and your 20s and you're here, then you know that making moral choices that way based on your own feelings and emotions is the cultural norm, and that is all you've known. So, what is the truth going to do? How's it going to help us to stand firm when everybody else bows? What does it look like to represent truth in this changing world? Romans 12 verse 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, the culture will tell you only to believe certain parts of the Bible or pick and choose the parts that you like and just kind of put the other parts aside. If it feels good to you, then, yeah, follow that part, but you will become the judge of truth. And it really, when it boils down to, is it's the same question that Adam and Eve faced in the Garden of Eden when the serpent came and said, you can be like God, knowing good and evil. We like to feel like God. We like to be the ones who are in that position of determining good and evil and determining truth ourselves. But what it means is we end up trusting ourselves more than we trust God. Now, let me tell you, I'm 58 years old, and I know there are a few and probably not too many of you here who are older than me. And uh, you're probably thinking, you know, for some of you, you're thinking, yeah, you're still a young guy. Um, and uh, I appreciate that. 
but I maybe just feel sorry for you. But, uh, but my guess is most of you are, are younger than me. And you're thinking, yeah, you, you've got a few years on you. But let me tell you what getting a few years on you does. It helps you to learn a little bit about your world and about yourself. And one of the things that I've learned about myself is that I'm not necessarily a good judge of truth. I have changed over the years. My perspective of the world has changed over the years. My understanding of truth has changed over the years. And as a result, not only have I learned that I'm not a good judge of truth, but I've learned that you're not a good judge of truth either. And I don't want you determining what truth is for me. But also, I don't want you to think that I'm going to be up here determining what truth is for you either. Now, maybe that sounds weird to you because I'm up here, but I think the Bible has a good perspective, and it goes like this. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. You see, you have to determine how you want your worldview and your view of God to be developed and to be shaped. Do you want to just pick it up from the culture, be like everybody else, have the same worldview as our world does? Or maybe you're saying, well, I, that's why I'm here at church. I want my worldview to be shaped here. Well, let me tell you that Pastor Chris and Coastal in 30 minutes a week can't shape a worldview that has been shaped otherwise throughout the whole week and throughout the rest of your life. So you got to take some personal responsibility for that yourself. you got to begin to read and study the scriptures for yourself, the, the source of truth. You see, what my prayer is today for you is that what I will do is spark a desire in you to go and find out the truth yourself from the source, from the scriptures. The second thing we want to look at today is the truth about ourselves, the truth about me, the truth about you. You see, the world can change the way that we view ourselves away from the way that God sees us. Then it also changes the way we live, the way we act, the way we interact with our world. Our four heroes here, they had had their names changed when they were taken off to Babylon. The Babylonians gave them Babylonian names instead of their Hebrew names. Daniel, his name they gave him was Belteshazzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that actually was the Babylonian names that were given to them. But the Babylonians believed that if they could make them think of themselves as Babylonians, they were more likely to act like Babylonians. They believed this truth, that actions are determined by belief. You see, God created you. We actually sang about that in one of the songs this morning. God created you, and he created you with a purpose. And if our culture can change your perspective of that, if it can make you view yourself as instead of a child of God, just another animal, a child of the universe, anything less than a child of the creator, then it takes away your sense of purpose and mission and meaning. And that is what God created you for. Colossians 2 verses 8 to 10 says it like this. Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in Him so you can see and hear Him clearly. You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without Him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. You see, the enemy tries to change our identities by making us think it's foolish to believe in God, that they have wisdom that we don't have, that it's foolish to believe in religion, and the religion is no longer relevant, that verifiable evidence is somehow superior to faith. In our culture, this is done through comedy and satire. It's done through our entertainment system. It's done through our education systems. And it's done through controversy and scandal within the church. And then the media picks up on it and makes us somehow think that that represents all people of faith. And we don't want to associate ourselves with it. As a result, as Christians, many of us are intimidated by the world. And we become convinced that we should keep our faith private, relegated to just a personal experience in our home or maybe at church one time a week. 
But in contrast to that, the world is incredibly bold about what it believes and expressing its beliefs, and, and they shame Christians into silence. Embarrassed by our faith and apologetic, we bow, choose to bow instead of stand firm. They somehow make us think that we have lesser value than they do if we are people of faith. But God clearly says otherwise. A few weeks ago, we heard Pastor Chris say, you are who God says you are. You are called by Christ. You're chosen. You are capable. You are complete in Christ. John 15, verse 19 says this, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But I chose you out of this world, so the world hates you. You see, what we would prefer is a Messiah, a deliverer who would come and change our culture into a Christian culture where everybody would love us and it would be easy in this culture. But instead, he's chosen us out of the culture to change us into people who believe that through us, he will change our culture and our world. So that brings us to our third point, then truth worth sharing. You see, our culture demands that you bow to its influence. The question is, will you bow or will you take a stand? Now, do you want to be a difference maker, an influencer? Do you want to stand out, rise above, be a leader? I know you're all wanting to stand up and say yes, right? <laughs> Probably not. There's a few of you that are going, yes, that's me. Yeah, we got a few. I knew there'd be a few. But my guess is most of you are going, no. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be noticed. I just want to fly under the radar and not, not make any waves. Well, let me tell you this. Every bit of interaction that we have with our culture is filtered through one of these two filters. Number one, will I or will you be influenced and shaped by your culture, by my culture? Or why, will I be an influencer and shape my culture? You see, we all have influence. God has given us influence. If you're a parent, you have primary influence. God has created you as parents to influence and raise your children so that they have a foundation of faith and a biblical worldview. We all have families that where we have influence. You have friends, neighbors, coworkers at the ball field and social media. Identify the places that God has given you influence and use them to share and live truth. And that truth is Jesus. Now, please, as we mentioned earlier, there are mean Christians out there. Don't be one of those, especially when it comes to social media. Don't be that person. Don't use it as a bully pulpit. But instead, be an influencer and be an influencer with grace. We must give grace, but we must also live truth. You see, we each use our influence to promote the things that are important to us especially the things that have changed us and had an impact on us. You know, it's interesting to me uh, that people seem to have a stronger conviction about eating or not eating at Chick-fil-A. They're more evangelistic about being vegan and by far more evangelistic about Clemson or Carolina than we are about our faith in the truth of God. But I've got to ask myself, why is that the case? Why am I that way? Why am I so hesitant to share my faith in God? I'm a chaplain. You would think that would be easy, right? It's on my badge. I wear every day. But still, I struggle with that. Could it be that I'm not letting God shape and change me, that the power that is within me is not overflowing me because I haven't been in the presence of God and letting the truth fill me and change me? Acts 4 verse 13 says, After they found out that Peter and John had, had no education or special training, they were surprised to see how boldly they spoke. They realized these men had been with Jesus. You see, being with Jesus changed and empowered them. It gave them something worth talking about. And if we're going to have the courage to stand against our culture, we've got to spend time with Jesus and believe that he is in the fire with us. He's in the lion's den with us. Acts 1.8 says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. You'll be influencers. You see, he is with us in our fires. In the Old Testament, he was beside them in the fire. But look at this. Because of this passage we just read, now with us, he is inside of us, not just beside us. He lives in us and goes with us everywhere we go. You see, it seems like the times that we experience this closeness and this intimacy the most, the most powerfully is when we are 
in the fire. A couple of months ago, Pastor Chris asked me to speak today. And uh, I've kind of had a policy that whenever asked, I say yes. And I said yes, and we chose the book, The Daniel Dilemma. I read it. I listened to it. I took lots of notes. I added my own thoughts into it, and I've kind of boiled it down. And it came to a head about two weeks ago where I just came to a point where it just wasn't going any further, and I couldn't figure out where to go with it. I was getting kind of angry and frustrated, and on Saturday morning, my wife and I were talking and praying together, and I told her at that point, you know, I think I'm just over it. You know, if I had the choice and the opportunity, somehow I could do it, I'd call Pastor Chris and say, somebody else speak, I'm, I'm done. And I was really at a point where I was just saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't think I have anything to say, anything worth saying. I, w I was at the end of my rope with it. I came in here on Sunday morning, sitting right over here, Second or third song of the service, we sang a new song that I'd never heard before, Another in the Fire. I suddenly went, oh my goodness, that is exactly what I'm talking about in two weeks. And suddenly it was like God broke through in my life and he reminded me, Galen, I am with you in your fire. I'm in, with you in this fire of preparation. I'll be with you this morning in this fire of presentation. And I will be with you and I'll be with them in the fire of, of application as we go forward into this world. And God reminded me that he is with me and he is with you in our fires. Now whether you are one who shies away from standing out or whether you're one that steps boldly in or whether you're one who's thrown into the fire, we all have fires that we go through. But know that God will go with you through your fire. He'll be in the den of lions with you, and he will deliver you. In that song, and we're going to sing this song at the end of the service, there was a phrase, I count the joy in every battle because I know that is where you'll be. You see, the battle or the fire, that's where we feel him closest. That's when we know the intimacy with God is when we're going through those tough times because then he's right there with us. So be strong and be courageous because he is in the fire with you. He is the fire inside of you. You see, fire can consume or fire can propel. God will harness the power of the fire that intends to consume you and turn it into the power that propels and empowers you. So as we wrap it up here this morning, to be an influencer for truth, you first have to have a foundation of truth. Surround yourself with people of truth. Build a knowledge base of truth that'll stand when opposition comes and begin to ask yourself why you believe what you believe, why you accept what you ex accept, and does it stand the test of scripture? Be intentional about developing your worldview. Turn to the lasting source of truth and learn the truth in it. Read, study, know the scriptures. And if you're new at this, don't start at the beginning of the book. Jump to the New Testament. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And read the, the stories of, of the letters to the churches that are about practical living. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, the truth is a person. And he wants to be the fire inside of you. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are with us in our fires. And God, yes, we're fearful people, but you're a powerful God. And God, I know that your power will surround us. It'll protect us. It'll go before us. It'll be on every side around us. It'll be behind us, and it is inside of us. And God, I pray that through your strength, we will stand firm, and we will be influencers for you. Fill us with the peace of your presence. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a couple different responses you can have this morning. The first one is that you can accept or surrender to the truth. And like I said, that truth is Jesus. If you've never entered into a relationship with God, if you've never surrendered to him, this morning invite Jesus to come in and be Lord of your life. The way, the truth, and the life. If you've done that this morning, we encourage you on your response card to let us know that. But also, we encourage you to go back to our prayer booth this morning. We have some prayer warriors who are back there. and 
Pastor Chris and some of the other pastors are going to be back there as well. One of the things we've been talking about is we not only want first-time responders to go back there, but we want to encourage everybody who feels like God has spoken to them to respond. So if you're one of those first-timers, go back and ask for prayer. But if you're somebody who's been a part of Coastal for a long time, we still feel like God is going to speak to you. And God wants to move in your life and he wants you to step out in faith. One of the things that you can do, I know it's hard to step out in our culture, but the first step can be stepping out here and saying, I need God to be my strength. I need somebody to pray with me. I need to have that source of fire inside of me. So whatever burden you have, whatever fire that you've been going through, we encourage you also, don't carry that with you today, but have somebody pray with you before you go. Also, like I said, we're going to be singing the song, Another in the Fire, at the end. And so one of the things we want to do today is we just want to be back there at the very end. I know that song touched me in a very special way. My hope is that it will touch some of you as well. So even if you want to respond to the end of the service, that's fine. You can go back then as well or during that final song. The third thing we do this morning is we share a meal together here. The, Lord, the Lord's Supper. Jesus, when he was with his disciples the last time, he shared a meal with them, and he, uh, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body that is broken for you. And this cup, it represents my life. The blood was my life that's given for you. Take it. And when you do, remember the sacrifice that I've made for you. Now, there are tables all around this room. You can go by yourself or you can go with friends and family, step off to the side or bring it back to your chair. You don't have to be a member to participate. All you have to do is be one who is a believer, a follower of Jesus. So I encourage you at this point to respond to God. Good morning again. Um, this next song we're going to sing together, uh, it's the last song of today's service, uh, during which we're going to do a couple of things. We are going to take up your Connect card. So if you haven't finished filling that out, go ahead and do that right now. If you're watching online, uh, you can fill out your Connect card as well. Right on the top of the page there, there's an online Connect card, and we encourage you to fill it out. And thank you so much uh, 
for joining us online. We have a large and growing uh, number of people are watching our services around the country and throughout the day, and, and uh, even at 6 p.m. We have a 6 p.m. service online that a lot of folks are watching. So if you're watching us tonight, we're glad to have you. Uh, the other thing that we're going to do during this song is we are going to take up your, your tithes and your offering. And uh, here at Coastal, there's a lot of different ways to give uh, to the ministry here at this church. Uh, you can see from the screen, uh, a lot of people give uh, through our offering envelope. Uh, there is a, a giving kiosk out in the Welcome Center. People use that. There's also a giving kiosk over at Child Check-In. So when you're getting your kids or dropping them off, people give there. Uh, or you can give through texting or through our website. And if you're watching online, obviously, uh, you can give online. A lot of different ways to give at Coastal. What matters, though, is not, uh, we like to say, not how you give, but why you give. Uh, we want you to give out of love, out of gratitude, out of worship. Uh, make it a part of your just everyday life. You know that God owns everything. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. We, there's a lot of things that we do, uh, autom we automate, right? M many of you automate your bills and uh, you give uh, knowing that it's just a part of your, your, the rhythm of your life. Let me ask you, is, is giving your offering, is that a part of the rhythm of your life yet? Um, are you experiencing the joy and the expectation that comes from knowing that God owns it all and you're just planting seeds into the kingdom and you get to see what happens as a result of your faithfulness? Um, I hope that that's true of you. And I hope that you're, you've experienced the joy uh, of giving in your life. There's a lot of great kingdom things happening here at Coastal, and we get to invest in those things. And so uh, your offering envelope, again, you can automate your giving. Uh, you can uh, put this in the mail, and uh, we'll take care of the, uh, the postage. Um, I hope you've been blessed today. And remember, we have been blessed uh, to be a blessing. Make sure on your way out, you stop by the... Uh, uh, Daring Faith cam Information Campaign uh, meeting table. So you can go ahead and sign up for one of those 13 meetings. Uh, pick up a blue uh, coastal bag and uh, fill that up with uh, groceries, canned goods. There's a list inside the bag. And make sure as you're buying school supplies that you pick up some school supplies for Operation Christmas Child. Again, if you're a guest with us today, uh, make sure you drop by uh, the blue welcome and guest tent. Pick up a gift from us. Um, and enjoy our cafe and some cold brew on your way out. I think that's all I got for you this morning. Do me a favor. Everybody smile again. Keep smiling. Stand up. Let's sing this final song together as we receive your Connect card and your tithes and offering.
lift up your hands with me. There's no other name but your name, Jesus. Come on, let's sing it together. And there is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come with me in the space between.